morning. Welcome to yet another very interesting, fascinating webinar. And this one is very, very special to me. Um, Tevi Troy, who is a, a dear old friend, um, who I met when he was working as a senior staffer for Senator Ashcroft, way back when, um, is a very prolific writer and a phenomenal historian. He's written five books, and um, his most recent book is White House, Rivalries in the White House from Truman to Trump. I think it's particularly important that we hear this now because um, there have been some that have said that the Trump administration didn't run the most um, efficient, smooth <laughs> White House. <laughs> and um, it would be interesting to know, is this really an aberration or was the public just not cued in before to what goes on behind closed doors? And if there's anybody who knows what goes on behind closed doors, it's Teddy Troy who served in a variety of capacities from the Bush administration. Um, he was um, assistant to the president or deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy from March 2005 to July 2007, and was appointed in August 2007 as deputy secretary in the Department of Health and Human Services. And he also um, was a liaison to the Jewish community from the Bush White House. Um, so, um, as we are about to enter into a new administration, um, Teddy will tell us a bit of the history of infighting within the White House. Teddy, um, um, so first of all, in White House, you look at multiple administrations and their workings. What prompted you to write this book in the first place? Well, thank you for the question. And first, let me thank you, Sarah, for your many years of friendship. You know, we were neighbors in Kent Mill, and Sarah recruited me to the neighborhood. I love right. the Emmet talks. I listened to a great one with uh, Gil Troy and Natan Saransky last week. And I also really appreciate all the good you, work you and Emmet do at making the case for Israel on the Hill. So thank you for that, and, and thank you for That's having so me. Yeah. In terms of the book itself, in terms of Fight House, I came up with the idea in late 2016, early 2017. I'm a presidential historian, as Sarah correctly noted. And when people say things are unprecedented, and everyone in 2017, early 2017, was saying how fighting in the White House in the Trump era was unprecedented, I like to look for precedents. That's what I do. <laughs> and I said, let's look at previous administrations. Was there fighting in other previous administrations? And Sarah, I'll tell you, again, I'm a presidential historian. I worked in the White House. I spent my whole life looking at the presidency and I never looked at it from this perspective. And I found stories that I'd never heard of about really nasty infights in every single presidential administration that I looked at. Now for the book, I looked from Truman to Trump because Truman is the first person to enter with a White House staff full time. Before the Roosevelt administration, before FDR, you didn't really have a White House staff that they relied on the cabinets for their staff. And mm -hmm. under Roosevelt, there's a commission called the Brownlow Commission. The determination of this commission was that the president needs help. And the help came in the form of these White House aides who were supposed to have a passion for anonymity. That went away, obviously, but the White House aides did not. And so it starts under Truman. So I decided to cabin the book, because there's so many fights, to look at just the period from Truman to Trump. And again, I found so many fights in every single administration. And kind of the, the thing that drove me throughout the whole book was a quote I heard from Peter Robinson who was Reagan's speechwriter. And he said, and I heard this from him in early 2017, that of course there was fighting in the Reagan administration. In fact, there was a lot more fighting in the Reagan administration than we knew at the time, but we didn't have Twitter, Twitter, Twatter at the, at the time. So I decided to look into the archives, look into the oral histories, look at the biographies of what had happened and see what was the true history of fighting in the White House. And I found that um, the Trump White House certainly had fighting, but all these other administrations did as well. So which White House do you believe was the most contentious? People are always surprised by my answer, but Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, <laughs> nicest guy in the world, uh, had a relatively short 895 day or so administration. Um, but I think because of his niceness, he was not able to control the people under him and really put a stop to it. And in fact, there was one particular actor, a guy named Robert Hartman, who was a friend of Ford, who knew Ford longer than everyone but one person on the White House staff. And he was uh, thin-skinned and a bit of an alcoholic and a bit of a control freak. And mm -hmm. he really caused a lot of trouble and consternation inside the White House. Uh, and I'll give you just one example. 
he kind of parked himself in the ante room next to the Oval Office and made that his office. And from there, he tried to control the presidential inbox. And if he wanted something in there, he circumvented the staff process where everyone had to look at something and he just shoved it in the presidential inbox. But if he didn't like something that he saw in there, he pulled it out and leaked it to Evans mm. and Novak. <gasps> that is just not a way to run a White House. And eventually Ford had um, Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney became his chief of staff and deputy chief of staff. And Dick Cheney was tasked with finding a way to control this guy Hartman. <laughs> and what he did was he went to Ford because he knew that Ford and Hartman were close. And if he said, you got to get Hartman out of there, it would never work. But he said to Ford, he was very clever, this Dick Cheney as a young guy. And he said, and he was early 30s at the time. He said, Mr. President, you really need a room for quiet reflection and contemplation so that you can think about the great issues of the day. And <laughs> Ford said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And so Cheney said, okay, and he's going to do it. And he made that office that was uh, Hartman's office into the office for quiet contemplation and Hartman <laughs> found himself locked out of that office and it was closed off to him when he showed up for work the next day. Right, right. So, and actually I saw Dick Cheney and I told him I was working on this book and he starts to tell me the story and I told him, it's a great story, sir, but it's in my book. So. <laughs> That's hysterical. That is amazing. So obviously you don't see any kind of trends. You don't see this because the Ford administration was several, several years ago. So or do you think they're getting more contentious? Do you think people are, are running to the media with leaks more frequently now than they used to? Oh, I, de I definitely think so. I, I think that, th that that was a particularly nasty White House, but I, but I think the media environment has completely changed. Uh, so I'll just give one other great story from the Ford administration. Don Rumsfeld, as I told you, was, was chief of staff. And they were looking to rearrange things because things were not going well. And they planned this whole raft of staff changes, including where Nelson Rockefeller was vice president but would not be on the ticket the next time. Rumsfeld was going to move from chief of staff to the um, to Defense Department for the first time. Cheney was going to become chief of staff. Uh, uh, James Schlesinger was going to be out at defense. Uh, Kissinger was going to lose his national security uh, advisor authorities and he would just be Secretary of State. So a whole bunch of changes. These changes later were classified as the Halloween massacre. But before this came out, because it happened in, in late October, but before they came out, Rumsfeld gets a call that Newsweek has the story. And this is on a Sunday. Newsweek has the story about all the staff changes you're going to make that you're trying to keep secret. And Rumsfeld has tickets to go to the Redskins game. They were still called the Redskins back then, so I could say it. And <laughs> Rumsfeld says in his memoir, he said, well, I knew that Newsweek couldn't publish till Friday. So I went to the Redskins game first before we figured out how to deal with the fact that Newsweek had this story. So they had five days to deal with it because they knew that there was no way that Newsweek could get this story out earlier, which is just amazing when you think about today's media environment. That's hysterical. That's hysterical. So um, who were some of the nastiest White House infighters, do you think? Yeah, it's a great question. Obviously, I mentioned uh, Bob Hartman. Uh, his nickname within the White House was SOB, and he said it stood for Sweet Old Bob, but I don't think so. <laughs> it's a different meaning. Um, another great, great White House infighter was James Baker. Uh, Baker, I know in the Emmet world, is known as someone who was uh, not the biggest fan uh, of Israel. Right. In fact, there's the, the line right. about him that the, um, the Secretary of State's all tend to become anti Israel as a result of their tenure at State Department. And Baker supposedly said, uh, what if they went in in anti-Israel? <laughs> or what oh if they didn't anti -Israel? <laughs> so, uh, so Baker, I guess, not not, uh, not not most favored person in, in Emmett world, uh, but he was a master leaker and infighter, and he was constantly uh, picking on uh, Ed Meese, who hmm. thought he was going to get the chief of staff job in the Reagan administration, got beat out by Baker because Baker was seen as kind of more skilled and more organized. And Baker was, was constantly mocking Meese. He called him a... Uh, uh, the puffin' fresh doughboy, uh, <laughs> nasty nicknames for him, but he also uh, would leak all kinds of bad stories about Mies, and he actually maneuvered Mies out of his foreign po policy portfolio. Mies was counselor to the president with a, a cabinet rank and authority on a whole bunch of issues, but there was this famous incident in 1981 where U.S. jets shot down two Soviet-built MiGs that were uh, Libyan jet fighters, and it happened in the middle of the night, and Meese chose not to wake up Reagan until he had more information. And the story in the press became that Reagan wasn't awakened when this thing, although he did, they did wake up Reagan eventually after they had collected more information. I actually think it was the responsible thing to do, especially since Nancy Reagan was constantly saying, you've got to let 
him sleep and um she'd say i want him horizontal is her way of saying he wanted <laughs> she wanted <Reagan's laughs> to nap. So she, she was very protective of reagan's sleep and the niece didn't want to wake him before it was necessary but nevertheless the story came out and clearly pushed by baker that uh that niece did not wake him in initially and uh, they maneuvered of Nice out of the foreign policy portfolio as a result of, of that debacle. So uh, I think Baker uh, would be up there. I mean, you, you read Fight House and there are so many great stories of nasty insiders. Another guy you don't think of because he shows up on CNN and seems all nice and grandfatherly uh, was David Gergen. Uh, and he was constantly involved in fights. And Gergen worked in the Nixon White House, the Ford White House, the Reagan White House, and the Clinton White House. People forget about it. Wow. And uh, he was constantly leaking in the Clinton White House, and people like George Stephanopoulos couldn't stand him. And he eventually moved over to the, the State Department. And they attributed a very high percentage of the early stories about how Clinton didn't seem to know what he was doing and was a mess on foreign policy. They, they attributed a lot of those stories to Gergen. Interesting. Nickname, Interesting. And one more thing on Gergen. His nickname was Professor Leakey because he went to <laughs> leak so much. And there's a famous story that in the White House Situation Room, after Reagan is shot in March of 81, that um, Gergen keeps leaving the room, excusing himself, you know, perhaps ostensibly to uh, use the restroom. Uh, but uh, Richard Allen, who was a national security advisor at the time, thought he was going to call reporters to leak to them about what was happening in the whole debate over what to do with Reagan being shot. Wow, wow. He the leaky, Professor Leakey nickname either way, whatever he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how big a role has Israel policy been as a factor in White House infighting? You know, Israel, as you always say, Sarah, is a very small country, but uh, disproportionately paid attention to in the national media, but also in White House infighting. And what I found is that there have been an astonishing number of the infighting incidents that I talk about in the book had to do with Israel. And this is not just my own bias because I'm interested in Israel issues. I, mean, I was just looking for the best stories about White House infighting, not about my particular interest areas. And what I found is that Democratic administrations especially, there's a lot of noise about Israel. Uh, you go back to uh, 48 and there's a big fight about whether to recognize Israel. And this fight uh, included George Marshall, who was the Secretary of State on one side, who did not want to recognize Israel. And Truman tasks Clark Clifford with making the case for recognizing Israel. Clifford wins the day, something for which we should all be grateful because Israel you know, has been recognized mm -hmm. in the U.S. and has been a great ally of the U.S. for all these decades. Uh, but Marshall is so mad that he loses this fight that he never again speaks to Clifford or utters his name for the rest of his life. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> in the Johnson administration, there was a big fight before the 67 Six Day War. And um, Johnson kind of goes along with the national security establishment uh, that wants to press Israel not to make a preemptive strike. As we all know, Israel did make that preemptive strike, which probably saved Israel from the amassing Arab armies. Uh, but there are a bunch of White House aides, the kind of political White House aides at the time. Remember, Johnson's Democratic administration, um, and it was kind of different from what we now know, but these, the Democratic political operatives were very pro-Israel at the time. And they were making a case that Johnson's uh, State Department declaration that the U.S. is going to be neutral in thought and deed uh, in that war uh, was seen as very offensive in the Jewish community, and um, and they pushed very hard in, to have John be more supportive of Israel in the '67 war. And then the famous incident of the U.S. Liberty, where Israeli uh, the Israeli Navy shoots down a U.S. ship in the waters off Israel, the national security establishment wanted Johnson to come down very hard on Israel. The political aides were more supportive of Israel, and Johnson ended up being backing Israel and accepting Israel's explanation for what happened with the incident of liberty. So there, um, so these are two incidents in which kind of infighting was beneficial to Israel, because um, if you didn't have the infighting, the prevailing national security establishment views would have been against Israel. And so uh, also in Fight House, I have other incidents in the, uh, uh, in the Obama administration, there was some infighting uh, on Israel, although um, Israel didn't often come out on top in, in those fights, but um, Rahm Emanuel nicknamed Ben Rhodes, Hamas. Can you imagine? Nicknamed Hamas inside the White House. And Rhodes outlines this in his own memoir. He admits that his nickname was Hamas, which is something I would personally be embarrassed about, but he admits right. it in his memoir. And Rhodes helpfully gives a, uh, an incident or an example of how the nickname was used. And I'm going to say it, this is in Rahm Emanuel's voice. I'm going to say it without the curses. But <laughs> Rahm Emanuel would say it was Hamas here pointing at Rhodes wants to make it so that I can't make it to my effing kids bar mitzvah in Jerusalem. 
So, uh, wow. yeah. <laughs> so yes, Israel largely, frequently an incident uh, in White House and then of course in the Republican administrations as well. James Baker made that very nasty crack about Israel that we all, all know and Emmett people I'm sure have it all memorized about uh, <laughs> F the Jews, they didn't vote for us anyway. Well, that quote, we only know that quote because it was leaked to the newspapers, not just any newspaper person, but to Ed Koch, who had a New York Daily News column. Koch runs it in his column. The quote, the leak comes from Jack Kemp. And Jack oh. Kemp, and, uh, and, and he was a HUD secretary, not a foreign policy aide, but he was always very, very pro-Israel. Oh, and, and, and Kemp and the Baker got into it on Israel in, in that administration. Yeah. So with a new Democratic administration coming in, um, do you see any tendencies um, that um, maybe um, coming out of the Obama administration, any people um, to inform us where the Biden administration um, will be in terms of infighting in Israel? Yeah, so, so two points on that. First of all, I've been pleased not to see Susan Rice, who had a very combative relationship with Israel, and Ben Rhodes, who was nicknamed Hamas, get roles mm -hmm. in the administration thus far. It's still early, but thus far, mm -hmm. and a lot of the big roles, including the the, the top roles of National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense have been chosen. And those three people who got those positions, uh, Jake Sullivan, Anthony Blinken, and now Lloyd Austin, are not known as Israel critics. So again, I'm not saying they're Emmet-like fans of Israel, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. in the same degree, uh, but, and they wouldn't you know, necessarily have all the same positions that, that you will have, Sarah, but right. they are not known as Israel critics, which I think is the, the important distinction that we should be looking for here. So that's one thing. The second thing I, I would say on this point is that when it comes to democratic administrations, for the most part, and it's counterintuitive, we should be rooting for infighting, because if there's no infighting, it's probably the prevailing view is not on the pro-Israel side. So we want infighting because at least the, the pro-Israel views will get will get aired out. So again, I don't know if that's going to play that dynamic will play out in the, administ the Biden administration, but I go into Democratic administrations rooting that there will be at least some infighting so that Israel has means that Israel's voice is being heard. Are you concerned about the um, very, very left wing tendencies within the Democratic Party and that the Biden administration might be pulled to try to um, satisfy that part of their base? Uh, yes, of course, I am concerned about the anti-Israel tendencies within the Democratic Party. But I, I take this uh, fr from my perspective. And again, I, as you know, I'm a Republican. I've served in Republican mm -hmm. administrations. I don't want Israel to be a wedge issue for mm -hmm. Republicans. I want Israel to be a bipartisan issue where both the Democrats and the Republicans support it. Right. Even if it doesn't necessarily benefit uh, my hopes that the Jewish vote goes more in a Republican direction or anything like that. Right. I think we are all better off as Americans and as Jews if both parties are supportive of Israel. So yes, I do worry about the trends within the Democratic Party. And if you see polls all the time, you ask uh, rank and file Republican voters, do you support Israel in its uh, you know, in, in the struggles yes. with the Palestinians, the re Republicans overwhelming, something like eighty percent say we, we support Israel, and if you ask Democrats, it's under fifty percent mm -hmm. we support Israel, going lower. So I do worry about that. But again, my hope is not that we have a wedge issue where we say Democrats are, are the bad on Israel party and Republicans are the good on Israel party. Where I'm trying mm -hmm. to get, and and my friend Mark Melvin, who's again a partisan Democrat, is trying to make sure that the Democrats stay in that more pro-Israel direction. And and I would say of the various candidates that ran. In this recent go around, mm -hmm. Biden is probably the best on Israel that we had. Right. Out there. So, right. if you're going to have a Democrat again, you know I'm a partisan Republican, but if you're going to have a Democrat, Biden is, is the best of the lot. Uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, the fact that he's 78 suggests that that may not be where the energy of the youth in the Democratic Party is going, but uh, we should work for better things and not for worse things. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, who do you consider the um, key Jewish insiders in the White House throughout history? Well, number one on my list has got to be Henry Kissinger. I mean, that guy was an internal beast. I mean, he was such a brilliant bureaucratic infighter. He comes in in 1968 as national security advisor to Richard Nixon. And we see him as the, you know, the, the great guru in foreign policy, but he didn't see himself that way when he was about 40 entering the administration. And he had a thick German accent, which was not necessarily an advantage in American politics uh, 20 years after we'd finished our second war with, with the Germans. Uh, he was Jewish, which was, was, was not an advantage at the time, to be sure. Uh, he was a Nelson Rockefeller guy and not a Nixon guy, which, which didn't help. And so he was seen as someone who had all the disadvantages. William Rogers was the Secretary of State, old friend of, of Nixon, um, much more part of the WASP establishment, 
uh, he didn't have the disadvantages that Kissinger had. And so it was seen that Rogers early on would be the guy who had the leg up. But the way it turned out was not that way at all because Kissinger uh, marginalized Rogers, uh, leaked against Rogers, would leak against himself and blame it on Rogers. I mean, Kissinger was a master of all these bureaucratic techniques. And, and in the end, he, he got Rogers forced out. And he had both, Kissinger got both the National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Portfolio, the only person ever to do it. So uh, Kissinger has got to be in my uh, Jewish White House infighting Hall of Fame <laughs> first pick. Right, right. So um, have you ever looked back and compared the tremendous infighting that we see in Israeli politics with the infighting in American politics? How would you compare them? Oh, Israeli infighting is amazing. It's just a, it's a, it's a pleasure to watch, in fact, because it was so nasty <laughs> and so much great stuff in there. I mean, obviously, the most legendary fight is between Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres. And I, I tell the story in an article I wrote for uh, Tablet Magazine a couple of months ago. But what happens is that Peres is the defense minister and Rabin is the prime minister during the great moment of the Entebbe rescue, right? Mm -hmm. Israeli forces do this really bold step and they go and they um, rescue is, uh, Israelis and Jews who have been uh, captured from an Air France flight and they're held, held hostage in Entebbe, Uganda. And I'm only repeating the story because Sarah, I know you know it well, but yeah. when I talk to younger people, they don't know the story anymore. And it happens July 4th, 1976, America's Bicentennial, and they rescue all these hostages. One Israeli soldier dies um, tragically in it, and it's, um, it is Yoni Netanyahu, the current uh, prime minister's brother. Uh, and uh, it's really seen as a great triumph for Israel. But immediately after, word starts going out between Rabin and Paris. They each start sniping at each other and blaming each other. And Paris puts out the word that he was in favor of the attempting the rescue and Rabin was against it. And what Paris does to solidify this is he embraces the Netanyahu family and takes a young ben Benjamin Netanyahu under his wing and helps set him up with the Netanyahu Institute for Fighting Terrorism in early days. And he kind of gets him on his start in politics. And he does this you know, partly out of the goodness of his heart and partly because of the uh, her heroism of Yoni Netanyahu, but partly as a way to stick it to Rabin. And then <laughs> fast forward 20 years, when Rabin is tragically assassinated, Peres wants to become prime minister and he runs for office. And who runs against him but Bibi Netanyahu and defeats him in a surprise win. And right. it's only because Peres had set up Netanyahu in his effort to get Rabin that right. Netanyahu becomes the force that eventually defeats him in Israeli politics. So that's, that's a great story. Um, another one is the rivalry between Abba Ibn and Golda Meir. And they really hated each other. And <laughs> Golda Meir uh, was once told, uh, someone was extolling Ibn's virtues and said that uh, Ibn speaks five languages. And uh, Golda said, well, so does the waiter at the King David Hotel. <laughs> and then at another time, Golda is told, that Abba Ibn, who was, um, who, who was British and was very popular in America, uh, spoke perfect English. Uh, he said they, that, uh, that Ibn is thinking of running for, a, for prime minister. And Golda looks at the person and says, of what country? Oh, my God. Now, Abba Ibn, who was very clever himself, uh, also gave it back, said, I'm told that she has a Hebrew vocabulary of 1,000 words. Why doesn't she use any of them? Wow. <laughs> it could be really nasty. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, Israeli infighting has, has not only the nastiness of American infighting, but the wit of the Jewish people behind it. That's right. Well, it makes for a better read, too. That should be your next book. <laughs> I, heard, I heard a pretty long article on it, and we'll, we'll see if it can make it into a book. There's some uh, it's, it's fascinating. So um, in terms of the relationship, between ambassadors and presidents, um, Israeli ambassadors, how would you rank them and how does that affect um, America's overall policy towards Israel? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and if you know, Sarah, I just wrote an article for Mosaic Magazine about the Israeli ambassadors to America. And the reason I wrote the piece was in large part because um, Gilad Erdan is going to become the Israeli ambassador to Washington very soon. He's already the ambassador to the UN and he's gonna be the first person to double hat it since Abba Ibn, who had both roles. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron Dermer, who I know has done stuff with Emmett, uh, he's, he's gonna be returning to, uh, to, to Jerusalem. So 
uh, I just thought it was an opportune time to look at the history of these Israeli ambassadors because you know they've they've really done some great work. Uh, even going back to Abba Ibn, um, who went and and met with uh, Truman, and um, uh, and Truman kind of uh, when when Abba Ibn went and kind of was pre presenting his credentials, Truman kind of watched it aside. He said, "Let's just talk. You know, let's, <laughs> let's actually have a conversation." Um, and then Abba Ibn uh, was frustrated in the Eisenhower administration. He actually had this great line about. Um, uh, how America had much to recommend it, uh, but its Israel policy was not one of those things. Because, uh, oh. America was certainly the administration's, uh, and certainly the Eisenhower administration was not so pro-Israel at the time. But Abba even had the strategic insight that uh, Matt can appreciate these days, which was uh, work with Congress, and that Congress is sometimes more favorable territory to Israel. And, and he realized that early on and, and helped secure a $100 million loan for Israel that he never would have gotten from the administration, but he was able to manage uh, through Congress. So I think I think those relationships um, have been important. Um, I tell a great story in an article about um, Simcha Dinitz, who was the Israeli ambassador to Washington during the 73 Kippur War. And at the time, the American administration, after the initial losses by Israel, Israel had kind of turned it around and was gaining grounds and it surrounded the Egyptian Third Army. and Kissinger wanted Israel to pull back and not press their advantage because he was concerned that the Soviets were going to get involved. And he gets Simcha Dinitz on the phone and uh, he says, Jesus Christ, don't you understand how important this is? And Dinitz uh, pauses and says, uh, I think I would understand the urgency a little more if you would cite a different prophet. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> and and even, uh, Kissinger said, oh, because he kind of recognized that uh, <laughs> perhaps that's not the right way to talk to the ambassador from the, the Jewish state. <laughs> so there have been these great relationships between uh, Israeli ambassadors and, um, and, the, um, and the heads of uh, uh, American government or senior people in American government. One other story I, I like to tell is about uh, Michael Oren, who was a historian like me, but also he became an ambassador. And he was trying throughout the Obama administration to get a meeting with Hillary Clinton. And they had an actual policy that he could not meet with Hillary Clinton. And she would just keep him away. There was, there was no way that he was getting a meeting with Hillary Clinton. And as much as he tried, he tried, tried. And one day he actually runs into Hillary Clinton in a meeting that was not one of these scheduled meetings, it was just something, that, something they happened to, to both be at. And she goes up to him and she punches him on the arm. She says, Michael Oren, I try so hard to get a meeting with you and you'll never let me know. That's chutzpah that, that she said well. that. But, uh, but yeah, really, really rude. Um, but uh, but uh, Oren got his revenge because he put it in, uh, in his great book, Ally. And, uh, yes. Good story about how poorly he was treated. One other quick story about that is um, after the incident where Joe Biden goes to Israel and uh, the Netanyahu government, not Netanyahu, but the government makes an announcement about uh, some building of some apartments in uh, in I guess territory that is disputed territory, but it's really the suburbs of Jerusalem. And mm -hmm. the Obama administration really overreacts. I think it was kind of a, a careful or planned overreaction. And, and they all, uh, the different levels of the government uh, kind of chide Israel at different places. I think this is where um, Hillary Clinton gave that famous call where she kind of tore into Netanyahu. But uh, Oren also had his chance to be called on the carpet by James Steinberg, who was the deputy secretary of state. and. Uh, Steinberg uh, tears in to uh, Oren over the phone, and he has his whole staff around him listening in as he's as he's blistering into uh, into Oren. And here's the story that you know you're already upset about the story. Story, you're gonna get more upset because Oren recounts that he later heard that all of Steinberg's staff cheered as he was attacking Oren. So it's a really wow. a nasty, unpleasant kind of thing. So yeah, so these ambassadors. Uh, I, you know, the reason I wrote the article is because I really appreciate all the good work they do on behalf of Israel, but sometimes they have to take some uh, some real bullets uh, for the team. Um, yeah. in order to really do heroic. Um, are you at all worried, Tevi, that because of the very close relationship that um, President Trump had with Israel and with Netanyahu, that um, the Biden administration might see that as radioactive and um, run the other way? Uh, so, so I'm I'm concerned about it. I, I told you earlier my sentiment is I want both parties to be supportive of Israel. Right. And I think uh, the, the Erdan Dermer switch. I think there might be some strategy behind it. And uh, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, Ruth Eglash, who is the Washington Post report, uh, reporter or correspondent on Israel for the last couple of years, she has now gone to, to gone to join Erdan's staff. 
Mm. I don't know if you saw that, Sarah. Nice. And, um, nice. and the um, Axios Tel Aviv, which is a very good newsletter, by the way, giving you an update on what's going on in Israel. I wish they called it Axios Jerusalem, but you know, I, I didn't <laughs> name it. But Axios Tel Aviv had this really interesting quote in there that Eglash has gone to help learn, teach Erdogan how to speak Democrat. <laughs> which I think is really interesting, A, because they're thinking about how to make, um, uh, how to make the ambassador more friendly to Democrats. Right. B, that they take someone from the media, from the news media, supposedly neutral news media, to teach them how to speak Democrat. So they didn't take a Democratic political operative, mind you, they took a media member to... Uh, to, um, to that's very that's telling. telling. <laughs> where we stand in 2020. Right, right, right. Um, so now we are going to open up um, the floor the questions. I, I just have to say before we open up, this book is so fascinating. Um, I'm ordering it. Everybody should order it um, at amazonsmiles.com and list a bet as your charity, <laughs> but everybody sure. should, should read it. All right, right. Just make sure we mention the name of the book again, which is Fight House. Fight House. It's, Fight it, it sounds like such, such a phenomenal read. So, Sarah Leah, do you have some questions that have come in from the audience? Yes, we have a few. Uh, thank you to everybody who submitted questions and thank you so much, Tevi, for joining us today. Um, the first question we have, was there fighting in the Nixon administration about opening relations with China? Oh, heck yes, there was. I've got great stories about this. I mentioned uh, Henry Kissinger earlier and uh, he, was, um, he was desperately trying to keep this a secret from William Rogers, who was the Secretary of State. And Kissinger ordered three different briefing books for the people who knew about the China thing, for the people who, um, who knew about the China thing, but not all the details, and then the people who are supposed to be kept in the dark on the China thing. And, the, and his staff had, kept constantly having to update the, the, um, the, the briefing. But the, the, this is a great, great story. That one time the administration goes on a trip to India and Pakistan, and there's a meeting and Kissinger's not at it, and he claims that he has some kind of stomach problem. And one of William Rogers' aides says, I bet you, Kissinger, I bet you Kissinger doesn't actually have Delhi belly, but he probably snuck over to China to uh, do some kind of opening with them. And Rogers, as I say this in the book, Rogers turned white because he realized that's exactly what had happened. That Kissinger wow. had kept this thing secret from him and, uh, and, and went ahead and, and planned the, and went on a secret trip to China to plan the opening. And then the other thing about this is that later on, when they have the famous meeting between Nixon and Mao, Kissinger maneuvers to keep Rogers out of the meeting and he succeeds in it and even Kissinger recognized in his memoir that it was kind of a, a nasty and kind of a cool thing to do but yes mm -hmm. there was fighting about the, the China thing and, and there's more detail on it in Fight House so definitely whoever asked the question should uh, read the book and will enjoy that chapter. Right. Thank you. The next question do you think with infighting that better results are achieved overall? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say that there's a continuum. And on one side of the continuum is complete dysfunction. Nobody trusts anybody. People can't get stuff done. Stuff gets leaked to the media. And uh, Ford administration is a little bit like that. On the other side of the continuum, and this is too far in, in this direction, is you have complete groupthink. Nobody's allowed to say anything contrary. Nobody's allowed to disagree. And that was the Johnson administration on Vietnam. And Johnson was so adamant that nobody would have different perspectives that there was a there was a kind of team of folks at the State Department who were actually skeptical on Vietnam and they were thinking about a different policy, but they were so frightened of Johnson that he might find out that there were people who were thinking in this heterodox way that they called themselves the non-group. They didn't even want to be called a group, they were called the non-group and they met secretly so that Johnson wouldn't find out about it. That's not mm -hmm. a way to have open and honest conversation. So let me give an example of one administration where I think infighting did bring about better results. In the Clinton administration, in the early years, Clinton ran as this kind of moderate DLC, Democratic Le um, Leadership Coalition, uh, I'm sorry, Democratic Leadership Council Democrat, uh, kind of a new different types of Democrat. But once he gets into office, he has a very liberal White House staff and they tack to the left, which is not how Clinton ran. Clinton gets repudiated in the 1994 election and Republicans win both houses of Congress for the first time in 40 years. Clinton recognizes that he has to tack back to the center. And so he brings in a secret advisor, codenamed Charlie, to give him more conservative advice. The White House staff, the liberal White House staff, is unhappy with this, and they eventually discover that Charlie is Dick Morris, who was a <laughs> advisor to Clinton, but also to a, a number of Republicans. And Dick Morris is 
somewhat integrated. He doesn't become a White House staffer, but uh, he, he's, he's kind of outed in that he loses his anonymity. And um, George Stephanopoulos and Harold Ickes, who were part of that liberal uh, White House staff, are constantly fighting against Morris, leaking against Morris, giving him nasty nicknames, making fun of him. Uh, Morris has an aide in the White House. They give him fake times for meetings so the guy won't know where to show up for meetings. And it's really nasty, ugly stuff. Uh, but Clinton does tack back to the center. And Stephanopoulos, who hated, hated, hated Morris, actually acknowledges in his own memoir that Clinton got better results out of his staff by bringing in Morris and bringing in this new creative tension. So sometimes having this kind of creative tension or disagreement, mm -hmm. uh, piercing of the bubble, I think can help bring things about uh, in a better way. And, and I will say to this, my own experience working in the White House, you are in a bubble. You know, you might look at the news and see what's being said, but you really, you're talking to people who share your perspective at all times, and it makes it hard to make decisions and with a full understanding of how they're going to be re reacted to in the outside world. I'll give an example of this was um, the selection of Harriet Myers in the Bush administration to be, um, uh, to, to be on the Supreme Court. Uh, she eventually pulled out, but the, uh, I don't think the Bush administration fully appreciated the negative reaction that they were gonna get from the uh, conservative right, the intellectual right, the Federalist Society world about the selection of Harriet Myers because there was a, there was a concern on the right that um, a president just saying, trust me, on a Supreme Court nominee was not good enough, that we needed some real uh, background and history and you needed to somebody to have shown that they actually had conservative credentials and uh, had thought about these issues and were gonna uh, rule in a more conservative way when they got to court. So I think not having an understanding of what people are saying on the outside, I think, and hurt an administration. And sometimes these fights bring in different perspectives so that you kind of pierce the bubble. Good question. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. The next question we have, could you walk us through the White House decision-making on high-level affairs? For example, moving the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, which was a promise made by many presidents previously, but for various reasons were not, was not delivered. Yeah, I mean, I, I could visualize the meetings in my head in previous administrations where uh, they would have the national security advisor plus the president, plus the chief of staff, plus the secretary of state, maybe the secretary of defense in there. And in every one of those meetings, the secretary of state, whether Republican or Democrat, would say, well, Mr. President, I know it's the law and I know we've supported it publicly, but uh, the Arab street will rise up and we can't do it. And uh, in this administration, they, <laughs> they just didn't have that. Uh, maybe it's because they had a different type of process in the meetings. Uh, or the State Department didn't just get to exercise it, its normal veto. Uh, but but that, that's basically how it works. And I think what we've learned in the last couple of years is that the Arab street is more of a myth and the American street is more of a political reality. Uh, I, think, I think that's been an interesting development in, in 2020. So uh, I think the Trump administration kind of tested this notion uh, of the Arab street and found that it, it's, uh, it's more of a myth than we thought. So yeah, I think uh, these mean, a decision that, that that's that high level would go to the president, you would have just a, a relatively small group of people in there. And if you had somebody objected really strenuously like the Secretary of State does in most administrations, they'd probably say, okay, we're not gonna do it. But in this administration, again, they, they didn't have the, that traditional approach to what the White House process should look like and it came out in a different way. Great, thank you. The next question, how has social media affected White House communications? Huge. I mean, I, 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 in, in so many huge ways. So, so let me give just one example. In When I worked in the White House, any statement that came from any person who was working with the White House had to be staffed. What, what do I mean by staffed? It went through the staff secretary process. These things would, would be photocopied and taken to every office by these people with a little cart, and you'd have to report back within 24 to 36 hours, depending on the urgency, of whether you were okay with this presidential statement. Nothing went out unless it went through this so-called staffing process. Today, we see, and this is in the Obama administration and the Trump administration, we see individual staffers have their own Twitter accounts. I cannot imagine that every one of those statements goes through the, um, through the staffing process. In the Bush administration, the only exception to that whole rule was Pete Wainer, a friend of mine who's uh, now at Ethics and Public Policy Center, uh, he would have sent out these Wainergrams to kind of influential people where he would 
write what he thinks was going on internally in the administration. He would get Karl Rove to sign off on it, but he didn't have the kind of broad White House sign out. And that was kind of groundbreaking at the time. And I remember one time one of those leaked beyond the narrow circle that it went to and, and be, became a bit of a press story. But today there's just so many avenues for a kind of authorized statements that are not going through the staffing department, th through the staffing process, uh, like the, these comments I'm saying on Twitter. Uh, uh, but the other thing is there are so many more ways to leak now. You could leak through DM or Signal, or there are ways you can get the message out. Remember the famous incident in the Nixon invention where uh, you had throat would meet in a private parking garage in the dark in Arlington to, to get the, these kind of secret messages out to Woodward and Bernstein. Now there's tons of ways you can get your message out to a reporter without anybody knowing. Now I, I will say uh, that there's also tons of ways that the national security establishment can probably track you. So there, it's kind of a cat and mouse game, the new ways of leaking and the new ways of discovering the leaks. Uh, in the Lyndon Johnson administration, by the way, uh, you had, you would have your calls placed by the White House operator. And Lyndon Johnson would get reports of what White House aides were calling which people, including which reporters, based on what the White House operators were telling. He also would get reports on where the White House military pool was taking people when they, there was a kind of a group of White House cars called the White House um, military pool. And White House uh, staff sergeants would drive people around uh, to various places if you had a meeting. And so Johnson would get a report on where people were being driven to as well. So that kind of stuff uh, was Johnson's way of kind of going after leaks. So again, it's a cat and mouse game. As the technologies change and make it easier for you to leak, they also make it easier for you to be discovered. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, oh, somebody asked where we could find the article that you mentioned earlier about Israel ambassadors and administrations. Uh, Sarah, I don't know, do you have a, um, a homepage where you link articles for the yeah. this, or, or maybe you can um uh maybe sarah Leia, you can put it in the chat but it's my article in mosaic this week oh, um, great about a few days ago yeah if you can put that in the, in the chat just uh, look tevi troy uh israel ambassadors mosaic it's, it's pretty easy find but yeah if you yeah. Put that, in the chat, everybody, that'd be great great i'll find that and send it into chat thank you um the next question could you comment on the infighting in the trump white house yeah, so in my book, In Fight House, I focus mainly on the administrations before Trump because I had access to more material, uh, archives, oral histories, even memoirs. So we read a lot in the press about the infighting in the Trump administration, but I can't say I have as full a picture of it as I do in the previous administration. And even in a recent administration, the Obama administration, I know so much more now after the Obama administration is over from a bunch of the memoirs that came out after the administration that were a little more open, shall we say, then before the administration ended, when the Obama team was very disciplined on this message of no drama Obama, and they didn't let people know that there was any kind of infighting. And it was kind of a bit of a black box. Post-administration, we have a lot more great stories, and I put a bunch of them in the White House. So I think we will know more about the infighting in the Trump White House in the years after the Trump White House is no longer um, in, in, in power. But I will say, we certainly have seen a lot of good stuff about the Trump White House, and I do have some of those stories in there, you know, the, uh, the Scaramucci 11-day uh, tenure and the um, uh, Reince Priebus versus uh, Kushner versus Bannon, early days of fighting, and the different waves of chief of staff from uh, you initially had Priebus when it, was, it seemed like a bit of a free-for-all, and then John Kelly tried to, um, to, tried to impose order in a military style, and then you had Mick Mulvaney, who kind of really wanted to uh, just advance conservative policy and kind of step back from the efforts to try and control Trump and access to Trump. And then you've had um, Mark Meadows in the last year who's gotten in trouble a couple of times by uh, leaking stuff to reporters in, in ways that uh, reporters, I guess, didn't protect his anonymity. So there, there have been almost uh, four different uh, eras of infighting in the, in the Trump White House is interesting. But one thing that I will say on Trump White House infighting that I think is of particular interest to Emmett listeners and Emmett members and Emmett supporters, and you should all be Emmett supporters, uh, is this idea that the nastiest fights inside the Trump administration are on issues where there is general Republican disagreement. And what do I mean by that? Issues like trade and immigration. The Republican Party writ large is not sure where it's going on those issues. And therefore, the Trump administration was divided on those issues and you had the nastiest infighting. On issues where there is more unity within the Republican Party and within the conservative movement, 
And on this, I include Israel, but I also include judges and deregulation. You definitely read a lot about less about infighting in the Trump administration. And so I kind of put out three levers that presidents have to control infighting uh, in, in White House. And one of them I have is ideological unity. If you have an administration that's aligned ideologically, you're going to have less infighting. And I think we, we see this in the Trump administration on issues where they agree and in and Israel is one of those issues where they generally agree internally, there has been less infighting. Thank you so much. The next question, uh, have any other previous administrations hired family members for high positions? Hmm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy was the attorney general in the Kennedy administration and the most important person other than John F. Kennedy in that administration. In that position, he was in a kind of death struggle against Lyndon Johnson, who was the vice president. The two men hated each other, hated each other so much that, um, that Kennedy's father said, Joe Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy said, uh, Bobby's my boy. When he hates you, you stay hated. These guys <laughs> hated each other from the 1950s when they both were in the Senate. Uh, Johnson was the majority leader and, and Ken, Robert F. Kennedy was a staffer. They hated each other when Kennedy was attorney general and Johnson was vice president. And then when John F. Kennedy is tragically assassinated, this power dynamic switches and suddenly Robert F. Kennedy was on top uh, as the top aide to Kennedy and Johnson's the kind of lowly vice president and then it switches and suddenly Johnson's the president and he has no interest in hearing from Robert F. Kennedy. So much so that they have a fight immediately after Ken Johnson's first cabinet meeting after John F. Kennedy's assassinated. And after this fight, they don't speak to each other for two months. Now I know in COVID you can go two months without talking to people and you know, maybe it's not the most unusual thing in the world, but Kennedy was the sitting attorney general in the Johnson administration. And so the president didn't talk to his attorney general for two months, which I just find astounding. So yes, there have been family members who have joined administrations in the past. Uh, there was also a law passed to, uh, to limit it. And so any subsequent hiring of family members has to make sure that you uh, don't, um, uh, don't violate the, the, the tenets of that law. Uh, so it's not easy to hire family members, but it, but as we see recently, it is doable if you follow a certain couple, of, if, you, if, if you follow a certain uh, series of steps. Thank you so much. The next question, do you think that uh, Vice President Harris would significantly affect Biden's decision-making in the future administration? Uh, I'm going to have to say I don't know on that one. Uh, Vice presidents have uh, been a very varied levels of influence in different administrations. Uh, if you look at the Kennedy administration, Lyndon Johnson had almost no in influence as vice president. If you look at the George W. Bush administration, uh, Dick Cheney was right in the thick of things and very involved in decision making. So it really is kind of a um, unique to each administration how they're going to deal with a vice president. And if, uh, again, we also don't have a full picture of Biden and his capabilities. He's clearly not the person he was when he was Obama's vice president, but he's also not the kind of sleepy Joe that, um, that Trump was claiming he was. So he's somewhere in between. Um, and I've seen different models when a president isn't uh, kind of at their best. You could have the, um, the chief of staff kind of running the show. You could have the vice president who's the kind of person in waiting uh, running the show. Or if you think back to the Wilson administration, it's outside of the, of the realm of what I cover in White House, but in the Wilson administration, Wilson's wife takes over. Edith Wilson is basically running things while Woodrow Wilson is, is incapacitated. So it's not clear which power center will emerge if Biden is not at full effectiveness. Uh, I'm sure that if uh, Harris feels aggrieved and uh, feels like she's not being listened to, uh, there will be lots of strategic leaking from the Harris shop making that case and saying that she's not listened to for whatever various reasons. Uh, but, uh, but we don't yet know exactly how Biden and Harris are gonna play together. Thank you. Uh, for our next question, do you believe that future presidents will use social media similar to how President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu have to bypass the media and contact citizens directly, or do you think there will be more regulations eventually developed? I would say the former, in that presidents are going to continue to use Twitter to get their message out directly, and uh, it's not unique to Trump. Obama did it as well. Uh, he had some 60 plus million Twitter followers when he wrote something. Most of it was written by the political operation, but sometimes Obama would write something directly himself and he would put the letters B-O at the end of it. So you knew it came directly from him. Uh, Trump, I think, maintains the fiction that every Trump is every tweet is directly from him. Some are and some aren't. Basically, he's got Dan Scavino who, who writes a lot, a lot of the tweets for him. 
Uh, but, but I think Twitter or something like it will continue to be a tool for presidents. And one thing I wrote about in my previous book, what Jefferson read, Ike watched and Obama tweeted, which was about president's use of culture, is there are constantly new forms of technology, communications technology that presidents use to get their messages out, whether it's radio in the days of Franklin Roosevelt and the famous fireside chats that everybody talks so nostalgically about. Those are a way of getting over the media and directly to the American people. John F. Kennedy effectively used television to get directly to the American people. And in fact, he won the 1960 campaign in part because of his use of television and his better performance on TV in the first debate against Richard Nixon than, than he sounded on radio. And in fact, Kennedy, right after he wins election, is walking by a TV with one of his aides and he points to it and says, we wouldn't have had a prayer without that gadget. I love the fact that as late as 1960, they're still calling it a gadget. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I think whatever new form of communication that presidents have to communicate directly to the American people will be used by, by them in order to do so because they all feel like the media does not give them a fair shake. So, um, Teddy, I have an additional question and it has to do with our work and policy. Um, if you're, if one expects a certain amount of ideological unanimity, uh, in your staff, um, what happens when the evidence um, points to something different? For example, you know, um, President-elect Biden is talking about going back to the Iranian nuclear deal, and we just have reports about how they are building underground um, centrifuges right now, and that um, the Iranians will not let the um, IAEA inspectors in. Um, do they? have to walk in lockstep and say, yes, we must go back to the nuclear deal because that is part of our platform? Or will they entertain any evidence to the contrary? Look, presidents can change their minds and, and famously have on a whole host of issues. Like George mm -hmm. W. Bush uh, claimed he was going to be a domestic policy president. And then obviously 9-11 happens and he, he changes his focus. George H.W. Bush says in his campaign, read my lips, no new taxes. And he mm -hmm. raised taxes. Now, however, there are political costs to going against it. And George H.W. Bush famously did not win re-election after mm -hmm. he violated that, that promise. But mm -hmm. I think there are all kinds of stories where presidents change their minds. Uh, Barack Obama said that he was not going to change the immigration rules as a re re result of dreamers because it was unconstitutional. And he couldn't do it himself. It had to be done by Congress. And then he realized Congress wasn't going to act. And then he did it administratively. So mm -hmm. I think presidents can and do change their minds. I don't think it's their first inclination. I think they know that there is political pressure against them if they violate something that they said they were gonna do A and they, they go and do B. But, uh, but part of being president is you supposedly have access to the best information in the world and you've gotta make real time difficult decisions about what to do in those circumstances. And, and sometimes just the fact that you said A doesn't mean that you have to stick with A no matter what happens. Great. Great. So I just, um, once again, want to plug this fascinating book. Please get it. It's before Hanukkah and Christmas. You need some gifts. Um, and this, it, it, I, I have yet to read it, but it sounds like an absolutely fascinating book. And Tevi, I can't thank you enough for your wisdom, um, the length and breadth of your wisdom and your erudition and um, your friendship. Um, so thanks again. And I'd like to make a plug for this coming Thursday. We have Dr. Ken Stein from Emory University. Um, and he is the founding president of the Center for Israel Education at Emory, one of the few universities that actually has an Israel education program. And that's going to be at 12 this Thursday. And our um, New York um, chapter president, Lori Reagan, is going to be hosting that one. Anyway, thanks again. I cannot wait to read the book, Terry. Hey, thanks so much, and thanks for all the good work that Emmett does. I really appreciate it. Thanks.